Prepare for adventure in this huge open world game book series. Legendary Kingdoms is a game book campaign where you lead a party of adventurers in a world that adapts to your actions. Venture into ancient ruins, pick a side and lead an army into battle. Sail the high seas on your own warship, defeat tyrants or bring them to power. Along the way, your party will increase in skill, wealth and renown, allowing them to take on more challenging adventures. Reach the heights of power and you may uncover a dreadful threat to the world itself and go on a mission that spans all six game books in the series. Yeah, guys, so today we're going to look at Legendary Kingdoms. It's a kind of like a, a pick your own adventure type of book, but it's supposed to be so much more. I haven't played through book one. Book one is out. Book two is coming out on a Kickstarter within a week or two, uh, maybe a little longer. Uh, we, we'll be able to pick up a uh, book two so um, but we're going to review book one see if it's something cool it looks amazing it looks awesome um it, it's a solo rpg choose your own adventure style where you can actually gain armies you can gain ships supposedly you can uh once there, there's going to be six books i believe and you'll be able to switch between the books just depending on where you go on the map there's going to be a huge uh open world and um yeah sounds super promising let's get into it So hey guys, just a quick reminder, I made an Etsy store to match the YouTube channel. Uh, would be honored if you guys would go out and check it out, see if there's anything you like. It's all the old school stuff, a little bit of Red Rides and stuff. I will be uh, adding some Dungeon Master screens out there as well, just for fun. Thanks a lot. All right, and so here's a sample. I will share this link in the description so you guys can play as well. Let's look through this book real quick. Right off the bat, it's gorgeous art. I mean, this is a highly uh, professional, well done book by Spider Games, Spider Mind Games. I'm sorry. Book one is the Valley of the Bones. So what we're getting with the uh, Kickstarter in a couple weeks is uh, book two, which is Crown and Tower. Crown and Tower. Let me see. I've got a description of Crown and Tower over here. Yeah. So book one is the Valley of the Bones. It takes place in a desert wilderness. Uh, where the tyrant kings oppress the teeming masses. You can read it for yourself. Book two, Crown and Tower, takes place in a high medieval realm of Longport Bay, torn apart by the struggle for power between two noble families. That sounds awesome. I'm getting my hands. I am getting my hands, I think, on book two. Yeah, all right, so this is the world map. This is the Valley of Bones over here. This is where we are playing book one at. Um, and then book two is coming um, right here in Long's, Longport Bay. So that's gonna be awesome. But yeah, for now we're in the sample book in the Valley of Bones, and here's all the different locations in the Valley of Bones. We got this, we got Salt Dead, Chalice, Curses, Clifftop, blah, blah, blah. Uh, we got a lot more detail once we get to the actual book. That's cool, I love it. Welcome to Legendary Kings, Fantasy, blah, blah. blah. Basically, we make a party, and the difference between this and every other play your own adventure book, um, from what I've seen, from what I've played, well, there's a lot of things. First of all, it's not a single player. I play, I played the uh, Dungeon Dragons ones, you know, the pick your own adventure ones, and it's usually at least the new ones are, are just single adventures. This you're picking a whole party. Um, from what I understand, they can have relations if you want them to, um, or if that's what happens. I don't know if you have uh, opportunities or not um, to, to make them not do that. I don't know if you want to. Um, and yeah, you're gonna you're gonna be able to eventually grow an army. You're gonna be able to go to anywhere you want, uh, depending on if you own the books off the map and pick up a different book. And it's just open world. So their claims of what this is is off the charts, guys. It's off the if this if this is. Uh, if this truly turns out to be what they say it is, it, it's going to be one of the best solo uh, RPG adventuring, choose your own adventure type games of all times. It'll just be a blast. I don't know about replayability yet, but I know that even a first time playthrough, it sounds like it's going to be a lot of stuff. And also, somehow they're supposedly going to, the world is going to evolve around you based upon what you did. So they're uh they're setting out for some pretty lofty goals and i uh, hope they get anywhere near it because it sounds like a blast if there's any downside of this from what i've seen i haven't played it yet i've just kind of looked briefly looked through the rules but if there's any downside of this it's that the uh 
party members appear to be canned party members that you have to uh, choose four of six. There's like six op there's six options. You've got Sar Jessica Dane. Uh, she's kind of the fighter, kind of the uh, the noble fighter. You've got a spellcaster, Lord Tequan. Um, and you'll notice that, that you know they have their their abilities. So these are all going to come into play when we go to play. Uh, Tasha uh, looks like a buccaneer. So it's, she kept her she kept it under her bucket hat. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, so stealth is her is probably her game, and health um, fighting three. So yeah, then you got Amelia Pass Dane. If that last name looks familiar, uh, she's the sister of Jessica Dane, uh, but apparently she's the half sister of Jessica, and she grew up in Fosterly Castle, of course. Uh, her mother was a forester who took Amelia away from the castle when it became obvious that Baron Baldwin, her father, would take no interest in the girl. Mm -hmm, I've heard that before, so I'm guessing she's kind of like the ranger. Um, then you've got Akihiro. Like a hero of chalice looks like a little bit of a samurai kind of brooding guy he's got a, a good fighting good survival uh good health um good swordsman tortures himself over his failure to balance his mind and body it's okay like a hero come on man we can do this and then you've got brash <laughs> i love that name brash you'd think a guy a guy with the name brash would be a little tougher but apparently he can't fight for crap um, but he's got some health and he's um, it looks like he might be more of the uh, what's he got here basically he's he's just a good looking so really you, you're not really they're not really putting these people into like you know your four classes sort of I mean they're mixing stuff up so Brash has got good health uh, he kind of not okay as a fighter he's got a little bit of stealth and uh, he's just a good looking dude right he's Brash he's Brash um, so yeah he got in a love triangle um with the duchess and a king that's a problem brash that's a problem brash you need to stop trying to live off your good looks sir all right so as i said before uh we have every party member has five skills fighting which is fighting stealth sneaking around lore arcane survival foraging charisma blah blah we know all this right usually the values of your skills don't change very much however you might sometimes be told to improve or reduce your skills during adventures there's no maximum skill score but you cannot drop below zero let's remember that everybody we'll have skill checks sneaking past a goblin this is interesting check this out there are two type of skill checks individual checks means certain person and then there's team checks team checks allow you to choose two of your party members to combine their skills to pass the check let me back up as i said those are like the what six people and you have to pick four one two three four five six so no negativity necessarily so far this all just seems amazing and mind-blowing and i want to be involved in the kickstarter um i'm just trying to be honest here if i had to pick one thing without playing the game um it's that there's it's six canned players and i have to i'm forced to choose four of six but maybe they'll open up a way where you can make your own in the future that's definitely uh sounds like a possibility where i could just do it on my own who cares um but i'm guessing that they've kind of tried to make um these guys uh all these numbers are probably balanced if you pick the right four but again i'm, I'm i haven't played yet so to make a skill check you roll a number of dice equal to the skill being checked okay for a team check you can combine the skill dice for two characters for every die that is equal to or greater than the dc of the check you gain one success i'm confused but it sounds cool let's check this out here's an example tasha akihiro Sir jessica and lord tikwan are trying to sneak past a goblin on guard duty they need to pass the sneak they need to pass the sneak past the goblin skill check. Since this is a team check, the player chooses the two best party members at stealth. In this case, it's Tasha with a five, Akihiro with a three. The player takes eight dice and rolls them all. Because the DC check of this check is four plus, every result of four or more is a success. The player rolls a six, five, four, three, three, three two, two, and a one. So that's three of these dice have rolled four or more. So the team gets three successes. In order to pass a skill check, you need a certain number of successes. In this skill check, you needed four successes to pass it. Okay, I like it. Okay, okay, okay. 
I see where you guys are coming from. So the team and our example has failed and will now have to face the consequences. Obviously, we have health, health points. If they get to the zero, they're dead. We understand that. When a fight happens, your entire party works together to defeat the foes. When you get them into a fight, you will be presented with a list of opponents. Those are enemies. Uh, yeah. All right, stuff to remember, your party always strikes first in combat. That's cool. No initiative. You choose a member to go first, then select an opponent from the list to attack. Roll a number of dice equal to the opponent's fighting score. If the party member has no weapon, reduce their fighting score by one. To inflict damage, your dice rolls must equal or exceed the defense score of the opponent. For each die that does this, you inflict one. Okay. All right, so Tasha, with a fighting score of three, wants to attack a goblin with a defense score of four plus. She rolls three dice, two, four, and five. That gives her two hits to the goblin, and he loses, or she, loses two health points. And so our goblins have six health. Any order you choose with your party, if there are any opponents still alive after the entire party, the enemy gets a turn. An opponent's attack score is divided into two. The first number is the number of dice. The second number is the number they need on each of those dice to score a hit. Okay, so, and for monsters, uh, an orc warrior has an attack value of six, four plus. This means that the orc gets to roll six dice, each of which needs a four plus or score to hit. Huh, so it doesn't really take into account the character's armor. Starting with the first opponent on the list, make an attack with each opponent in order. So you roll, you decide which party member gets hit, and you reduce their health by that many points. Once all the opponents have attacked, you attack again. Rinse and repeat. Okay, and here we are on the very next column, talking about armor, so I missed this. Uh, and you can see from the description, armor reduces health damage, which I love that. If you watch one of my previous videos about armor class, that's one thing, one gripe I have about uh, D and D basically is that armor makes it harder to hit the opponent where I think that in my mind, and it could be wrong, I've never worn armor and fought people, but um, I would think the heavier the armor, the thicker the armor, the easier it is to hit the guy because he slows him down a little bit. Uh, what armor should do as they're doing here is should, uh, reduce damage so i'm in a full play armor i may not be as nim nimble as if i'm just wearing a t-shirt but if you hit me in a t-shirt you can do a lot more damage to me than if you hit me in full plate armor so the orc rolls to attack the orc hits you three times but then you get to roll if you're wearing armor a number of dice equal to that party member's armor score or equal to the amount of damage they have taken whichever is less okay for every four, five, or six you score on your armor save, you reduce the damage by one. Okay, so let's check this out. Sir Jessica, uh, or Sir Jessica, is wearing leather armor, which is an armor plus one, and is carrying shield armor plus two, giving her a total armor score of three. A hideous sand lizard in fact, inflicts four damage. She rolls three dice because she has an armor score of three and scores a four, five, and a four, which she has deflected three points of damage. She only takes one point. That makes sense. Perfect. Love it. Okay, then in the very next scenario, she gets hit with two damage. She can only roll two because she can't roll more dice than the amount of damage she's taken. Wouldn't be fair. Uh, she rolls a one and a three. She fails in both. She takes two hit points of damage. Monsters or opponents don't do this for armor. It's already taken into account based on who they are. And of course, armor is just about combat, not being hungry or crushed by rocks. Great. Got it. Thanks. Instead of making an attack, a party member can cast a spell. The description will tell you what happens. Automatic damage. Some enemies are so fierce that a portion of their attacks are unstoppable. Ouch! Such as a dragon. You will see this displayed in bold like this. In this case, in addition to the dimensional dragon's seven attack dice, it also inflicts an extra two points of damage automatically. Woohoo! You can make armor saves against this extra damage as normal. Fortunately, in book one, we won't find anybody this bad. Sweet. All right, so I like this. Characters who can cast spells are called spellcasters. Blah, 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 When you begin the game, spellcasters can cast three spells. When you begin the game, each of your spellcasters can start with three spells chosen from the starting spell section, which you'll find at the end of the rules in section just above paragraph one. So there's adventure spells, probably like, you know, make water. Uh, yeah, yeah. Then there's combat spells. These usually harm or hinder your opponent. Uh, got it. There's mass combat spells, probably like fireball. Um, oh, for armies, woo, that's gonna be fun. Sea combat spells, gonna be fun. I like where this is headed, y'all. 
There's adventure slash combat spells, so you can do both. So you got you got charging and recharging of spells. You use it, it's charged, you have to recharge it. Every spell has a recharge cost in its description, which covers the price of the spell components. Oh, all right, that's unique. You gotta buy spell special components. Um, if you're resting at an inn, uh, that's how you recharge. You might find some places where you can recharge a spell for free. The text will tell you when you can recharge a spell. It can get expensive to cast spells all the time, so only use them when it's urgent. Magic should be rare, it should be dangerous, and it should have a chance of blowing your face up or the person or, or your buddy's face up. Love it. You can find spells in the strangest of places, so keep an eye out for an opportunity to learn new ones. You can hold a maximum of six spells in your in your spell book at any given time. If your spell book is full and you discover a new spell you really want, you can rub out an old spell to make room for a new one. All new spells you learn begin charged. Oh, okay. Okay, okay. Not sure how you get the components magically, but that's what ma magic will do that. Magic will just be magic. You can't do the same spell more than once. All right. Can't have three ice bolt spells. Got it. You got 10 items max that you can carry. Items you can take during the adventure will be listed in bold. You can pass items between your party members at any time except during combat when you're making or when you're making the skills check. Okay, many items you'll find will give you one or more bonuses to your to your skills, health, or armor. All right, if you ever have one that has two of the same skill, only use the highest modifier. If I have a steel, if Sar Jessica owns a steel longsword with two and an iron short sword in her bag of one, she doesn't get three, she gets two. Two hand weapons are marked with an asterisk. You cannot use a shield. Got it, got it, got it. You get armor bonuses from all kinds of items. They add up together. Example, exactly. Chainmail and a shield add. That makes sense. You can't wear more than one suit of armor, obviously. You can only have one shield, obviously. You could have two shields, but then you couldn't attack. So we're going to just go with one shield. Magical rings, amulets, they still add together. Got it, got it, got it. You can simply, I love how they just say you can simply rub out an item. How does one rub out a sword? Um, very cool. Once you rub out a sword, it's gone forever. I like this. Silver coins are the standard currency. Who, can, who needs gold coins, man? We got silver. Uh, carry any amount of money. Cool. Silver is a lucky metal. Part of <laughs> I like this. Silver is a, a lucky. I was born in 1971. Silver is a lucky metal. If a party member dies and their body cannot be found, you can assume that luckily they weren't carrying the cash at the time of death. Of course. In other words, you don't lose the money when you lose a, a party member. All right. Only if I'm specifically told to lose my money do I lose my money. Very cool. We got the vault. The vault is a magical storehouse where your party can keep items and silver coins they want to keep safe, but not on their person. You can hit the vault with using a magic cabinet spell, which grants you immediate access at the time of your choosing. Some buildings might also grant access to the vault. No matter where you access the vault from, the items you store in it will be the same. Very cool. It's basically your bank, right? Like on, on a video game. For example, if you put a magical ring into the vault in Drake Hollow, you'll find it there when you open the vault in the Valley of Bones. Love it. Very cool. Fun. That makes sense. I mean, it doesn't really make sense, but it makes sense how the game. This is also something interesting. Codes. To keep track of the events that happen in your adventure, you'll be asked to record codes such as a B12 or an E13. When this happens, circle the appropriate code on the back of your adventure sheet. Don't rub out a code unless the book tells you to do so. Some, so this is how they're going to use these codes to determine what's actually going on and how you've done things, I, I'm assuming, um, when the time comes. Very cool. Sometimes you'll be asked if you have a code. If you do, go here. Occasionally, you'll be asked multiple times if you have a code. When this happens, check each code in the order in which you are asked. Otherwise, you may turn to the paragraph that doesn't make sense. Okay. There's other rules in the game, such as what to do with my ship, how to manage armies. We'll deal with all that later. This is the demo. We're going to figure out how to play. We're going to get find out if it's worth going to the Kickstarter and buying the new book and becoming a part of the Kickstarter. Uh, here's the Kickstarter sample. This is given for, for book one. They haven't gotten one out yet. They, the, the, the book two Kickstarter hasn't started, but I've been in contact or I've emailed the guys a couple times about this the, that wrote this. And they tell me the Kickstarter is starting soon, so I can say soon. 
Anyway, we're doing the we're doing the free start, so this will look a little different from the one you actually buy if you buy book one, which you can get book one on their website right now, and I'll link their website uh, in the description. You can go to the website, buy book one right now um, if you like what you see. Okay, I see what you guys did here. Your recharge isn't like a magic point; it's money. Way to go! Way to just try to take. You're just the man taking money. Got it. All right, guys, I'm going to blink away here for a second. I'm going to put our party together. I'll be right back. Okay, so before we get started, let me show you the party here, what I've decided to go with. Um, character sheets look like this, where there's the, the skill, the modifier. Here's the skills. Here's health. Here's equipment. Here's notes. Doesn't show me that I have anything at, to get started. So I just real quick pulled out my notepad and wrote down the people I wanted to take. I'm taking Sardane, uh, the best fighter. I don't have anything on her uh, that she has extra that I know of. Uh, Lord Taquan, I'm able to pick out three spells. So I took Ice Bolt, uh, Poison Stream, and Unfailing Strike, three combat spells. Quite confident that if one of these guys dies, this could be a problem because I got one guy that's got all combat spells. I got another gal, Amelia, uh, the, the half sister of Jessica, uh, she's unique. She's got some fighting, she's got some survival, and she can cast spells. So she's kind of like a, a druid. And so I took animal speech, wolf spirit, which helps you get if you fail survival, and armor heaven, which kind of is a buff. So cool. And then Tasha is the best sneaker person we have because we don't have anybody that's good at sneaking. Um, and so, yeah, we're going Tasha, Amelia, Lord Taquan, and Sardane. I don't know of any armor that they say they have right now to start off with, um, or money, or anything. So we're just going to get started on one. Let's get this bad boy rolling. You stir into consciousness. Heat and blazing sunlight. The slow rumble of a wagon. Heavy chains upon your limbs. You groan. Your mouth dry. Your stomach empty. As your eyes focus, you can see your companions, fellow survivals of the brutal pirate attack, crushed together with you upon the floor of a rolling wagon. You remember little since then, except vowing to your newfound friends that you would stick together, come what may. You are relieved to see that they are still alive. But where are you? Gazing through the bars of the wagon, your eyes focus on a blazing yellow-gray desert. To your left, Filling the sky are the stone walls, a massive and impenetrable mountain range that divides the barbarian kingdoms of the south from the antique and mysterious lands of Drake Hollow. But which side of the range are you? The answer becomes immediately apparent as you look beyond the smelly dragon yaks, which are ponderously hauling your cage. A vast, crumbling city of minarets and run-down adobe buildings fills your view. The sting in the air and on your lips tells you all you need to know. This is Salt Dodd, cruel throne of the tyrant Iron King. One of half a dozen tin pot dictators in the barbaric Valley of Bones. You are far from civilized lands here. Thin faced slavers with spears rattle the sides of your cage, barking at you to get down. You slump on your hindquarters. For the moment, there is nothing you can do with you and your companions in chains, but you swear you will regain your freedom and you'll start your lives anew. But first, you must survive the horrors of slavery. The slavers have sold you to the dreaded Salt Dodd Arena, a grim place where the poor and criminals alike fight to the death for the savage entertainment of the crowd. The Salt Dodd Arena is the second largest complex in the city, with only the ancient palace of the city looming larger. Its dungeons go deep into the earth, where prisoners, slaves, and monstrous animals are kept in large vaults, with only the feeblest light pouring through barred arches set high in the ceilings. Your quarters are a large and ancient hall, whose walls bear the sigils and faded murals of a more civilized age. Within this chamber are crammed nearly a hundred hungry captives, sleeping rough upon the gravel floor and relieving themselves in stinking buckets stacked in a far corner. You ask about feeding arrangements from one of your fellow prisoners who give you hollow looks. You'll know when it happens, he warns. 
Suddenly, a hatch at the top of the hall is swung open, and the barely cooked carcass of a mountain goat is dropped carelessly into the middle of the hall. There is a great crush as the prisoners surge as one to tear off the strips of flesh from the animal. A group of strong men from lost breath, slaves like you, batter the crowd away with threats, claiming first rights over the animal. You are starving. Puffing yourselves up, you and your companions put on a brave show before the slaves, shoving them hard and roaring bold threats. This will require a good deal of bravery and force. All right, so check this out. Threaten greedy slaves is a team check. It's a skill check, and there's a difficulty check. It's fighting, and it's four plus. Let's pull up our team um, and pick the top two fighters because that gives us the amount. So Sardane and uh, let's go the sisters. The Dane sisters are going to try to kick butt. So that gives us three. For Amelia, five for Sar, uh, Sar for Jessica, so that's eight. So we get to roll eight uh, D6s, and it has to be four or above, and we need four of those. So we're going to pull out our handy dandy uh, dice roller. This is the best one I liked. Uh, let's try this. I like the faces on it. So I'm going to roll eight six sided dice, and we'll roll it one time, and I'm going to say go. And one. Two, three, four. So we got four. I think we did it. Your physical strength and martial technique intimidate the slaves who grumble and back down, allowing you to rip the choicest and best cooked flesh off the goat first. One of the slaves, a fellow called Tommel, mutters dark warnings about revenge. Snarling at him, you retreat to a corner to finish your food. We gain the code A2. You're almost relieved when the cruel overseers of the arena call you out of the filthy living hall for your first battle. You're fed water by children in neck chains in a narrow, dusty chamber who present it to you in deep bowls from which you are expected to slurp. One of the children, a pretty blonde girl named Milagros, quietly advises you to keep to the edge of the arena and not to engage in the central melee. Don't use magic. They'll take your tongue. Guards push you on before you can question her further. You're unchained and shoved into one of the gate rooms. Through the heavy portcullis, you can hear the crowd muttering in anticipation. You can see a number of crude weapons laid out for selection. Any party member may take a single crude blade. In addition, a single wooden shield and a maul. Too soon, the portcullis opens to a roar from the crowd. Blinking in the glare of the sun, you emerge into the deadly arena. There is an almost full crowd in the huge arena, with rich and poor alike rubbing shoulders on long wooden benches. On the sandy and blood-stained floor of the arena are a number of bones and skulls, artfully left to bleach in the sun. You can see that all ten gatehouses have opened, disgorging teams of poorly armed slaves. Some are fearless men and women from the chalice, who do not so much as flinch as the crowd roars for their blood. Old barbarians from lost breath hold their arms and weapons high as they seek endorsement from the bloody-minded crowd. Most of the warriors, however, look more like frightened peasants, mere fodder for the skilled warriors of the arena. Seen high above the arena, upon a throne-like seat, is the Iron King himself, a black-bearded, middle-aged man, his jagged iron crown sitting proudly on his skull. Next to him stands his bodyguard, the fearsome Malronak, the Death Engine. The solid metal golem was cast in the Elder Age of Sorcery and has turned aside the blades of a dozen assassins. At a cold and distant motion from the king, the battle begins. One team of excitable youths from the gate adjacent to you makes a sudden rush, hoping to catch you off guard. The crowd roar in joy. The bloodshed is about to begin. You must fight. Okay, so we have slaves and we have a leader. I guess the slaves are just one group. There's not a, a multiple amount, so that's fine. That, that's good because that means they don't, they're just going to do one attack as well. 
but we go first. There's no initiative, right? So the party goes first, and their defense is three plus with a health of 15. So let's get started. I'm going to obviously go with Amelia. She picked up the two-handed, no, I'm sorry, uh, Jessica. Let me just say Jessica. Jessica picked up the two-handed maul, which gives her a plus one on fighting. So she gets six. Let's go with six dice. And ba-jam. One, two, three, four. She gets four damage. Uh, correct? Four damage. That's how many are over. So there's 11. Let me just come out here. Lord Tiquan is not going to... Uh, is not going to... Uh, cast any spells because the little girl told him not to that ripped the tongue out um so yeah he's just going to i don't know what should Tiquan do should he get in the fight i guess he's going to get in the fight he might as well he's gonna he's gonna just try to punch the closest kid there's some little teenager right there he's gonna try and punch him in the head Kick boom jack's a little boy up right amelia takes out her uh punch She's a puncher too, but she's got a stronger punch. And she's got three. Kajam. She only hits for one. Taquan was just as good. Taquan gives her a kind of a <laughs> look like, look how good you are. Uh, that's a nine. And yeah, so Tasha has. A blade which doesn't do anything. She's got three as well. I wonder if I could just do all these at once. Why would there be a difference? Anyway, she does two to them. We're all fighting all the slaves right now. That's just the choice I've made. Boom. Seven. Okay, it's now the uh, slaves and leader attack. The slave slaves are going to attack. They get four dice and they've got to get five or above. I believe that's correct. So, and they're attacking Jessica. They all don't like Jessica. Oops, sorry. Boom. Ah! They hit her for three. So they jack her up. She's got no uh, armor at this point, right? So she is down to five. The slaver is going to attack Tasha because of Tasha. Tasha has a blade. And so he gets to roll three. He's got, oh, wait, hold on a second. My bad. Five plus? Yeah. Yeah. Great job, guys. Well done. He gets to roll three. He needs a five plus as well. At Tasha. Man. He does two damage. So Tasha is down to six. It's our turn. Wish we could do... Uh, spells, but not the time for spells, sir. Jessica is going to take out her 5 plus 1. I don't know if I did 6 the first time, but whatever. Let's go 6. Kabam! She's going for the slaves. Uh, was it 4 plus 1, 2, 3, 4? And I think it was 4 plus, so she did 4, so that's a 3. Let's check this. Uh... Oh, three plus. My bad. Forgot that. So let's just double check this. One, two, three, four, five. As opposed to four. All right. Tiquan. Tiquan rolls and misses. Uh, Amelia starts punching and hits three times and she kills the rest of the slavers with her fists. Slavers are dead. Tasha's going to turn her anger upon... Oh, wait. Timeout. She was attacked for two times. She gets to roll because of her wooden shield, correct? Forgot to roll for her shield, so let's go two, and it's four, five, six. So, yeah, she only took one damage, not two. Good job, Tasha. Uh, and now Tasha turns her anger upon the leader... Leader is a four plus. Tasha gets to roll three, four plus. Nice. She does three damage to him. And he has five. So let's just let's just make a little note out here. Homie's got two damage. He's still mad at her, so he's gonna roll uh three. He don't like the Tasha. 
He rolls a four, so he hits with one. Tasha can roll a one to get a four, five, six to block. She does not block. She takes another damage. Jessica is going to turn, and I think she's going to jack old boy up. Bam! And kills him. The fighting is chaotic, and more slaves come to join the battle as the fight rages on. Sarjaska is separated during the scrum. After slaying an opponent, she is suddenly bull rushed to the ground by an enormous lost breath barbarian, her weapon scattering from her grasp. The barbarian hefts his axe high above the helpless knight. You must rescue her. Amelia dives to rescue her half-sister. Amelia dashes to Jessica's defense, but alas, you are far too out of position. The axe lands with a sickening thud. Remove three health from Sar Jessica. You manage to impale the barbarian from behind, kicking his dying body away from the knight. You haul Jessica to her feet and spin around to face the rest of your opponents. The arena is a swirl of swords and axe blades, the crowd jeering as blood is spilt and bodies fall. In the center, the greatest fighters have gathered together into a spectacular melee, while on the outskirts, the cowardly and the injured seek momentary respite. Spitting on the bloodstained sands, you stride into the central battle, back to back, sword in hand. All right, so we're taking on a bunch of barbarians and a bunch of swordsmen. Seven five for the barbarians they're gonna look around and they're gonna decide who to attack i'm gonna make it random they would probably attack jessica's my guess but let's see one two three four going on the list they attack jessica and there are seven she is almost dead three damage to amelia Tiquan screams, enough, and begins to mutter in a strange language as sparks begin to fly from his fingertips. He's got Ice Bolt, but make an immediate f attack with a fighting score so of eight against any opponent. So I get to roll eight. I could finish off the Barbarians there. I could do the Unfailing Strike, which happens automatically, which is three. How much do those guys have left? Five. Mm. Or I could do Poison Stream, which gives two fighters five. I'm going to do this one um, because I just want to save the people from attacking Jessica. Hopefully she can survive this battle. So, one, two, three, four, five, six. Shredding all the barbarians. Amelia cries out and dies upon the sand. With a final flourish, you slay your last opponent. Although there are other living slaves in the arena, the battle suddenly stops as the Iron Knight stands. In a thickly accented voice, the king declares you champions of the arena. The crowd goes wild, cheering you heartily as you catch your breath from the intense battle. Any hopes you had that being made champion would grant freedom are soon squashed. Instead, you are disarmed and led back into the dungeon to nurse your wounds. Did any party members use magic spells while in the arena? If so, they are taken away by the guards to a small room where their tongues are cut out and then sealed with branding irons. We hear Lord Taquan scream in pain and return without a tongue. Each magic-using character loses three health and cannot cast spells unless they can find a way to regrow their tongues. Oops. I'm going to put an X here saying I casted that one. I casted that one. It doesn't matter because I don't have a tongue. As arena champions, your quarters are improved a little. You now have your own cell to sleep in, half the size of an in-room with a dirty straw mattress. In addition, you are given some basic training from an experienced gladiator called Che Long, who claims to be a sword saint from the nearby city of Chalice. The meals are slightly better as well, with Milagros, the slave girl, serving you rice and cooked meat as well as your water ration. All your party members can restore health for health points. Between training bouts, you have many talks with Che Long, who is damning of the Iron King's rulership of Salt Dodd. I care not who hears that this man is a tyrant. Life is hard in the valley, but wanton cruelty such as his is uncalled for. It sticks in my throat that I fight for his pleasure. I had heard that all the kings of the valley are petty tyrants, you say, between mouthfuls of water. It was not always so, mutters Che Long. In times past, we were ruled by a noble queen, the immortal Everchild, who cared more for her people than her comfort. 
after the destruction left by the demon Lord Abraxas, all that was left was ruins, and without her leadership, the people of the valley became little better than barbarians. Only Chalice has a glimmer of civilization left. After a hard day of training, you make your way back to your cell. You have another bout in the arena tomorrow, and you will need all your strength. During your evening meal, one of your characters has wandered off. Choose which character this is. Let's go with Tongueless Boy. You turn a corner to see Tommel, one of the thugs you bullied in the dungeon on your very first day. He is accompanied by another muscular man armed with a club. I told you I would get even with you, scum. He snarls, advancing menacingly towards you. Well, seeing as it now is just Jessica and Tasha, I think we run for it. Or do we raise our fit? We run for it. We're hurting. Discretion is the better part of valor. You attempt to bolt. Tommel, diving to make a grab for you. You must use the stealth ability of the characters you have chosen. Oh, okay. I get it. This happened to Tongueless Boy. He's taken off running. Oh, boy. Tongueless Boy doesn't have much stealth. What is his stealth? Two. So I have to roll two and get four plus, And I have to get both of them. <laughs> oh, boy. Let's go, Lord Tiquan. Four plus. One. Failed. You are grabbed and pulled. You are grabbed and pulled to the floor. Tommel and his brutish friend beat you with clubs until the shouts of the guards chase them away. Lord Tiquan loses three health. All right, guys. So I'm going to cut it here. I feel like I've given you more than a taste of how the game works. And plus, I'm getting real close to something that happens that's really interesting in the story. I don't want to burn it for you or blow it for you. Uh, go out and get the uh, the demo. I'm going to put it in the description so you can try it out, see, what, see how you like it. This is uh, much more of a intense choose your adventure book than I've ever experienced. I like the idea of codes. Um, I like the idea of owning armies and ships. I don't know how they're going to do it, um, but I just briefly looked through the rest of the uh, sample. It looks great. Uh, it gets interesting and a lot of fun. Pretty bloody. I already lost one of my four, pretty much two of my four people, almost three of my four people. Uh, so yeah, it's rough. They're not pulling any punches. Uh, this is a great game. Um, and the Kickstarter is starting soon. I will um, share the website. I'll share the store. I'll share all the links I can for these guys. I think this is probably worth it. I'm going to probably support this Kickstarter for sure. I want this second book. I want the first book as well in actual uh, book format. Uh, it's gorgeous. It's awesome. It's fun. I like the idea. Um, and yeah. So I'm down. That's my review and playthrough, a uh, little bit of playthrough of Legendary Kingdoms. Check them out. They're very cool. They're very responsive on email. Um, they're really, uh, they have a lot of belief in their game and they want as much participation as possible. So yeah, go for it. Guys, this was awesome. Uh, I loved it. And uh, go forth, adventure, have fun. And as I always say, if you can see inside a dragon's nostril, you're way too close to it.